it would be polite to thank you for inviting me to speak under normal circumstances. It's even more appropriate because in, if you'd invited me in two months' time, I might be a complete foreigner, depending upon what happens in the UK with the re referendum vote. So this initial slide shows a fictitious sign um, which teases the state in the United Kingdom about the state of cultural heritage, the status of cultural heritage. Pointing to closer, closer, yeah, 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 closer, intimate. <laughs> okay. Yes. <clears throat> And this is because the experience for many people in the UK of cultural heritage can be disappointing. But it's also perhaps a metaphor, a parable, about what might happen to the UK in the European context next month. What I hope doesn't happen is that this sign would be on the cliffs of Calais, pointing towards a country that is now disappointed ruins. I want to take you on a journey, quite quickly, but over a long period. Here we have a set of Neolithic stones that are between, they were constructed probably between three to 4,000 years BC. They survived quite happily until cultural protection began. And this was the first property in the UK acquired by the state for protection. Protection from what? Well, of course, if you put a fence up and say, keep out, it's to protect it for the public, but it's to protect it from the public. One of the unfortunate consequences of the railings early on was that a student was impaled on the top of the railings by trying to stand for a photograph. So protection has its downside. If you visited Stonehenge during the 1930s, you would have been admitted by someone who looks rather like the prison officer. And your admission would be under strict control. Yes, you could enjoy yourself, provided that you behaved. This was cultural heritage in the age of national monuments. We've seen a considerable shift in attitude over the years in the UK as to what cultural heritage is and how we engage with it. And that's one of the themes that I want to explore this morning with you. This is Dunham Massey. It's one of the properties under the care of the National Trust, an organisation that I've been involved with for many years. The problem with the National Trust is that it is a victim of its own success. It began to preserve and make available tracts of open land for the poor who had no amenity. It then gradually became a heritage body because the things that it was acquiring, which were of national significance and were about a nation, became very popular. And so the phrase cultural heritage management became an issue. How do you manage the enthusiastic public who want to see and enjoy heritage? This property is one of the most visited in the UK by the National Trust. It attracts over 600,000 visitors a year in what was originally a private house. So how do you manage not only physically but the experience of visitors? Um, on such a property and normally, well the joke is that country houses in England only developed stable blocks in the 18th century so that in the 20th century there would be somewhere to put the cafe, the toilets and the tea room. This stable block couldn't accommodate all of that and so a new uh, visitor reception building was constructed with a huge car park 
and it epitomizes what is happening with the National Trust. It is moving from an organization of protection to an organization of amenity, where cultural heritage is a resource. It is not something just simply to be conserved, but it's something that becomes an amenity that must engage with people of all sections of society. We have talked in the introductions, the lead-in to this event, about the relationship between cultural heritage and the economy. In fact, there is no line between the two. Everything to do with cultural heritage is part of and contributes to the economy, whether that is a national economy or a local economy. And just to give you an idea of the National Trust's contribution to both levels of that, the National Trust is now uh, almost at 5 million members. It has 60,000 volunteers who together every year contribute over 3 million hours of free time to help with path clearance or walls or um, to be stewards in rooms to explain the history. If that is quantified in financial terms, that means the National Trust is getting over £75 million worth of free help every year from its volunteers. That is a staggering achievement. No wonder, therefore, that the International National Trust organisation, which began not that long ago, about um, 15 years ago, um, represents organisations around the world who would like to emulate this success. But that's quite difficult because the key ingredients for a national trust are national heritage, an attitude or a culture of giving, whether of property, collections or time, and the support within the nation for this third sector. And I've been involved with a number of attempts in countries within Central and Eastern Europe who really would like a national trust, but those ingredients are just not there in sufficient strength for it yet to happen. Another way of tracking changes in attitudes about the relationship between heritage and the economy is the National Lottery in the UK, which now is one of the fewer and still quite large funders of cultural heritage. Um, my trust was one of the first to receive a grant from this lottery um, 20 years ago, and that grant was for 2.7 million pounds. And we got that on about 12 sides of A4 because the building that we wanted the funding for was just seen as having cultural heritage merit. Now it's considerably harder to get funding. It takes longer. There are all sorts of studies and supporting evidence that must be assembled. And that shift is now threefold in terms of HLF's objectives for support. The first is still there, that the heritage, the value of the heritage, its significance, must be worthwhile supporting. But the second one is about engaging with people through the skills needed in heritage. No longer is it sufficient simply to show people heritage through a visit or through some other mechanism. They must be involved in that heritage. They must learn something from it. And the third one is about resilience. Over the last um, six years since the economic downturn, quite a number of projects that HLF supported through a large grant have gone in, into uh, jeopardy. They're, they've encountered jeopardy because they can't sustain their operation. So HLF are now more cautious about that, but they're also more supportive. Our trust in the UK is involved with not only um, the delivery of 
projects or advising about them, but we're involved with every stage from looking at something that is a liability, right away through piloting it, the fundraising, coming up with business plans and the viability tests, the raising of the funds, the acquisition, and then the delivery, and then the, the operation of projects. And that gives us a remarkable holistic experience to draw upon when advising other NGOs or organizations. But one of the perverse uh, ironies about cultural heritage is that it tends to only get support when there's a crisis. If you look at this chart, and if it's possible to read it from the back, to the left hand side you can see the normal situation where value is higher than cost, whether it's a development project or an operation. In other words, there's always a margin. If you do something when you're finished, you end up with more than what you began with. That's not a situation that usually attracts funding support. As you can see, that if you don't look after something, the value gradually declines and the cost of bringing it back up to that value increases. To the point that on the right hand <coughs> side of the diagram, what was profit becomes what is called conservation deficit. And that's the difference between what something is worth and what it would cost to achieve that worth. And that's the territory that NECT operates in. But that's where you look for grant support because it's where usually the private sector will not <coughs> trade because it doesn't stack up, it doesn't work. And this is something that we're finding an increasing problem. We have had all sorts of European funding, ERDF, social funds, uh, rural development funds, but those funds are becoming harder to get. Um, UK government funding is also in decline. And so to achieve a project, that, uh, a successful project that hasn't got to the point of being an absolute crisis is becoming much more difficult. You can't read these figures from the back of the room. It doesn't matter what the figures are. The principle is that one of the other ways we become involved in not individual projects, but groups of projects. So think of a market town. Not a huge city, but somewhere perhaps between uh, 10 and 75,000 people, where the historic core has been in decline through lack of investment. We've been involved with quite a number of schemes where we gather together all of the property owners and the local municipality to raise funds that acts as an incentive grant to invest in that property, the conservation deficit. Without that program, they won't do it. The headline from this slide is simply that by raising about five million pounds of incentive funding, we can lever in a total of about 15 million pounds, so it's about one to two. In other words, the total is about three times uh, the value of investment in an area. And this is not just about capital investment, it's about changing attitudes to the market. That's the critical thing and a theme that runs through this presentation. Let me take a particularly large example which was a six-year project I was involved with, which was to reverse long-term decline in a city centre. The analysis indicated that there was probably 100,000 square metres of derelict floor space above retail premises in the city centre. It was a city that people went home at night, the shops closed, there were very few cafes, bars, restaurants. It was, dis uh, it was abandoned. Uh, and this was not just about encouraging individual owners to invest. This was about uh, a sea change of attitude. 
and over the six year period, because people were not isolated, they were collectively involved in the scheme, then once again people start to live in the city centre and the transformation was fundamental because confidence in the market was restored. We began the programme hoping that we would achieve about £75 million pounds worth of investment. The reality was that it ended up being over £200 million. Pounds. That's interesting as a figure, but it's more interesting that it's changed the way that the city behaves. It's also changed a number of other things, which is about employment, and about training, and about all of the dynamics that make for the vitality of a city, a historic city. I set up a foundation in Hungary um, which was trying to uh, transfer some of the experiences that I've learned, particularly in the UK but elsewhere. And one of the things we were trying to do was change the mindset about how investment works so that there was, yes, responsibility, but also a sense of venture which is risk, <coughs> leading to benefit. In such a situation, the uh, state sector, which is the red circle, tends to be neutral on cultural heritage. It, yes, it supports it, but it's not the main priority. It's about economy, employment, social welfare, and so on. The private sector is probably more indifferent to cultural heritage, unless it's to do with hotels or tourism. So it tends to be further down the scale of cultural heritage, but high on the scale of uh, economic value. And the underdeveloped NGO sector is obviously trying to push the other two further up the cultural heritage scale, but has modest resources to do that. And what we're trying to do is push everyone into the top quadrant where it is not just economic value or cultural value, but both together. And thereby increase the capacity for sustainable development and then um, uh, beyond that. Here are two examples, just very quickly. Um, outside of Budapest, um, this one is at uh, Shopkong between Budapest and Vienna, where a private uh, individual, um, a banker who had set up a foundation, used his own funds matched against European funds to bring a derelict uh, monastery back into use. An initiative that wouldn't have been undertaken by the state or a municipality and that there isn't really sufficient um, uh, track record or um, expectation in Hungary for an NGO to do that. But here we have an example where a, um, a country house that had been owned by one family who um, during the socialist era had moved away from Hungary came back the state owned their house, but they were able to get a, a long lease. That gave them the ability to set up a foundation dedicated to this site, and using funds raised from the European Union and from other sources, they've been able to restore it. I was saying to someone earlier, I do some teaching in the UK, but most of my research and teaching is in Hungary at a European Institute, <coughs> so both in Hungary, most of the students are international, mostly European, some from further afield, where the aim is to promote cultural heritage management within the wider context of understanding what Europe means and its values. And that's gone from teaching courses into setting up a new institute of advanced studies at Kerseg. And that is then undertaking a number of capital projects. So the whole relationship between education and implementation is being blurred. And I guess the message of a number of these projects is that 
um, there is a, a superficiality that we need to counter. Um, a typical example visually is facadism where people's perception is that heritage is only the first half meter of the building and everything that lies behind is up for grabs. The other building type which we find particularly difficult to um, portray in economic terms uh, are places of worship, particularly those that are falling out of use. When they are in use, they are generate economic benefits because of their maintenance. When they fall out of use, how can you adapt something where most of the significance lies in the interior? So if you strip that interior out, you lose the significance. Trying to get across to people that it's important to maintain rather than wait for a crisis was the subject of a study um, which was trying to quantify the benefits over a fixed period of time to encourage people to invest in heritage. And you can see, well, the figures will be too small, but that broadly speaking, it's providing the evidence to say that if you keep a regular program of investment, cultural heritage is much better. I've said that we tend to get involved when things become a crisis. These are three images of sites that we've been involved with that um, almost uh, cease to exist. The first one is a railway station. The second one was a cigarette factory. And the third one, there are two buildings, one of which was a coaching inn and uh, an early town hall. All of these needed an exercise of entrepreneurial risk to say these are so important for reasons other than financial, they have to be saved because ultimately they will bring benefits. In the projects that we do, each one is generating not only cultural value, but economic value and employment. And as a, a very rough guide, for every half a million pounds spent on the projects that we always take, that equates to about two and a half thousand working days, which is about ten people for one year. So if you multiply that out across all of the cultural and heritage projects that are going on every year, then you can see that it's not just the economic or financial value, it's the contribution which you've heard through other presentations so far this morning um, that is important. Most of you will remember a few years ago the crash of the Icelandic banks. Now, Iceland has um, a very narrow economy in many ways, very specialist economy. So what could Iceland do during that period? One of the things they did is that if you've ever been to Iceland or seen Iceland, the whole of the centre is just known as the centre because the communities, the habitations all around the edge so it's a very dispersed population of only about 300,000 people. How do you manage the cultural heritage that is so dispersed? And their answer during the crisis was, first of all, to involve local communities in the day-to-day -day management, but also to redeploy contractors and architects who had become redundant on cultural heritage projects. And it was a way quite modest, but there was a way of just making sure that skills were maintained and there was a public benefit as a result. This is an Erasmus Plus uh, event. I'm involved uh, in another Erasmus Plus project and the purpose of that project is to provide training for people who manage heritage assets. Very few people are trained to manage assets. They may be archaeologists or architects or curators, conservators, and as they gradually move up the levels of responsibility, they start to take responsibility for other disciplines, disciplines that they're aware of, but are they equipped to manage? The objective of this project is to provide modular training that allows people from whichever discipline they come to learn the skills about inter 
disciplinary management. The partners, this is just a quick slide, these are the partners. Um, and the aim is to develop this modular system so that there can be a degree of self-assessment as well as trainers and ultimately leading to some form of accreditation that will allow people uh, the ability through migration across Europe to find work knowing that they have recognised expertise. I also want to just say something about Europa Nostra. You've heard a little bit about it through uh, Mario, but Europa Nostra is um, quite a dynamic, active organisation that began as a membership body, supporting the members and campaigning on subjects. But that role has become much more dynamic of late. When the Congress was held in Athens in 2013, it was an opportunity to support what is happening in Greece, but also to use the awards that Europa Nostra issue as examples of best practice, the evidence base that cultural heritage can make in the economy. This report will crop up a number of times um, during uh, these two days, I'm sure it's already cropped up once, Morris referred to it. I've decided not to go into that detail, I think Ava's going to be saying something more about it later on, but the, the key things were the interrelationships between economic, cultural, social and environmental values. For us in the UK, what that means is investment in people. We cannot see cultural heritage simply as being objects that are always there. And particularly, one of my personal concerns is the future for young people who perhaps have graduated and have no opportunity to apply what they've learned. How can we harness the skills and enthusiasm of postgraduates in the cultural heritage sector more effectively, either through um, internships or through practical training? For us, uh, maritime or heritage has been a huge success where people have learned the skills and then gone on to full-time employment. You've briefly heard about the seven most endangered. The one bottom right that I've been involved with is in Subotica in Serbia, a huge synagogue that is derelict that really covers all four headings, but particularly cultural because it was built at a time when this was hungry, so there are issues to do with the relationship between Serbia and Hungary, but also between the Jewish community and the indigenous uh, uh, citizenship of Subotica. Another initiative that I'm involved with through Europe and Austria is the Entropia project, which is really about grassroots um, development cultural heritage and stimulus within local rural economies. It was launched in Kiosk in um, 2014 and um, there were 13 projects from around Europe to start this off. There are two that I'm currently involved with. One in the UK, which is the top, a small port, which has fascinating heritage uh, background but largely invisible and the one at the bottom which is a small alpine village in Slovenia where the population is dying. Young people, there, there is no employment for young people so it's an aging, dying community. How can we reinvigorate such a place? We've talked a little bit um, before we started today about food security and about the environmental issues of cultural heritage. One of the sites we acquired just over a year ago is a 60 hectare farm. Its significance is that it marks the very beginning of the World Heritage Site for the Roman frontiers, which begins in the west of the UK, runs across the UK with Hadrian's Wall, right through Europe, the Middle East and North Africa. 
how can we use that World Heritage Site to link communities and to look at the relationship between them as disparate groups of people and something that they have in common? This project is called Inherit, which is really about the ability to pass on to future generations something of value. And just some thoughts to, in that respect. We cannot talk about the economy and cultural heritage without talking about investment, whatever that happens to mean, not just financial. And that's about adding value to things in place, about management, about that stimulus of seed funding or advice, which, such as the um, European Investment Bank, in, Bank Institute is helping with. Um, for people, the theme throughout everything I've shown you is that we must change attitudes. Investment without changing attitudes is a waste of time. We must invest in young people and the next generation. And we must break down the silo mentality where we learn a particular discipline and lack knowledge about how to share it with others, either other disciplines or in other countries. And I think we need to be more of a risk taker in what we do. So I want to just end with a salutary image of what Europe would lose in terms of Britain's exit from the European Union and the cultural values that we contribute. Thank you. <laughs>